Hey, everyone. Welcome to Your Daily Detroit from the Daily Detroit studio at Tech Town. It is Thursday, February 1st, 2024. It is a brand new month. And here's the thing, guys. I got something very special for you. This entire table at Tech Town is full of... With voices you know, I am Jer Stays. To my left is... Devin O'Reilly. Across from me is... Cheyenne Serini. And to my right is... Norris Howard. It is a fearsome foursome. The Fab Four of podcasting in Detroit, if you will. Indeed. I don't know what I'm doing here. Not on a Friday, but... <laughs> <laughs> right? We like, can where talk. Did we find you? I mean, well, you were just like on a bird scooter or something, like wandering outside. Just wandering. grabbed you by the scruff. Yep. <laughs> We've got some stories that we want to talk about today. I think let's start out with something local that a lot of people will be interested in. There is news that Ford Motor Company wants to stick a hotel at the top of the Michigan Central Station project. There is not a hotel flag or operator determined yet. Part of this is that they're working on some rezoning because that station was originally zoned in a way that's extremely heavy industrial. This is a shift for them. And I feel like this is procedural. I feel like the city is eventually just going to do this. But to me, more interesting is the hotel and that it's not necessarily going to be like fancy penthouses at the top. And I think that's really interesting. Let's go around the table. Devin. Yeah, this isn't wholly surprising. I think we've actually prognosticated that this might happen when we talked about the mixed use. There was going to be office space. There was going to be hotel space. And there was going to be kind of public space on the bottom. You drive so, by the thing and it looks like a hotel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, so the, I think we knew that there was going to be uh, there was going to be a hotel concept in it. We didn't necessarily know where the top floors make sense. If you're not going to do residential, you put the hotel on the top floors. And I also agree with you. It is procedural. There's no way that the city doesn't go for this. Why wouldn't they? I mean, at this point, this is their golden goose. So it's going to happen. And it's great. I'm sure there'll be a luxury boutique brand up there. Now, Cheyenne, I know you love the social media and the gram. I do. There's going to be a lot of Instagrammable moments from a lot of people. By making this a hotel, I think this opens it up to, I mean, obviously it's going to cost some coin, but there's going to be some amazing regular images coming out of there. I think this is a very, very smart move on behalf of the Ford company. Just the project alone is huge, but then to add in an element of like top floor hotel space... It's going to be among the highest price tickets in Detroit. Oh, of course. But we were up on that top floor when they announced this project. Yeah, we have toured the building a few times. Yes, and the views from there are spectacular. And Even with crappy plastic windows. Even with crappy. (laughs) Those windows now are nice. So I am excited and I cannot wait to be able to experience that. Norris Howard, Prince of Brightmore. Yes, sir. I think one of the things that I really like about this is is this can become a landmark destination or a hallmark destination. One thing that, you know, many other cities just particularly have are these legendary hotels or legendary areas where you can stay in. You know, you think of the Plaza Hotel and other places like that in New York. This could be one of those things for the city, I think, to be able to stay in such an iconic building with the views, as you said, Cheyenne. And on top of that, also just being in that energy of Cork Town and, and having it be, you know, more walkable. And, and honestly, just having that kind of attraction outside of downtown I think is really important for the city because the more we can expand the attractions away from that core, the more the investment can come, the more those small businesses can sustain themselves, and the more people will actually view those areas as viable, not just for businesses, but also for residential. Obviously, Court Town has already received quite a bit of investment through hotels and apartments, but the more that's there, the more likely it is to continue that spread. And I think this is a net positive for not just for, but for the city as well. Yeah, Jared, I also wonder, though, in the announcement, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that there may be a bit, a bit of miscommunication. When you look at the train station, the top floor of the train station, and I'm even looking at your little graphic here, but I've seen other pictures. So people know, I actually have a sticker on my laptop from like, what is it, 2018? The top floor has massive, massive ceilings. It's Mm -hmm. begging to be an event space, like a luxury event space that you do Mm. like weddings and all that stuff. So when people say top three floors, I just think there may be a little bit of a misunderstanding. I think it's the top three kind of usable residential, whatever you call them, floors. And then the top floor... The, uh, in and of itself has, I don't know what those are. Those got to be at least 14. Like they're huge. They're, huge. they're gigantic. Yeah, like they're ball, gigantic. I, I'm thinking like huge maybe, ballroom. and maybe it's part of the hotel. Maybe it's the ballroom. Maybe it's the mm-hmm. event space. But I don't think you're actually going to see a hotel rooms on the very, very top of the train station. I agree with you there. We've been to the top of the Godfrey Hotel and that event space is, is important. And then 
the event space and bar that they did at the top of the book tower for the roost hotel. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good use for it because that top floor doesn't have to bear weight. You're I think they're money makers. I think you're right. Now I was going to ask you a question, Devin, because you have a bit of experience around development and such. What kind of flag are we going to see? What kind of operator do you think? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I'll say two things. One, you obviously you have the addition hotel. We, we can't you know talk about this without talking about the fact that there's an addition hotel coming in to the Hudson site. And that is a five star. So they've been saying that is going to be our first five star hotel. So we're talking about ultra, ultra luxury. The addition is of one of only like a handful in the world. Like we're talking Singapore and Madrid and all this. So we're going to have like a five star. This one I'm guessing is going to be more of a boutique type of flag. So you have like the autograph collection is what I immediately think of. A Marriott, it's one of their higher flags, but it's like there's the Henry Hotel, the David Whitney is becoming an autograph collection. It's their way to personalize a hotel and kind of make it of the time. So that's an idea, but they may want to take it even a higher level. I'm going, it's going to be major brand, but a smaller kind of boutique brand. Okay. I'd prefer that actually. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd prefer it to be boutique as somebody who much prefers a boutique hotel compared to it's so even, much better to travel in one and some of them don't have to be super expensive yeah like as this one's to going like, to be yeah as opposed <laughs> to like hyperlux five star like I, I would much prefer a boutique in that situation because i think you want that to be experiential you know i think you want this to be a whole thing where you know they keep you know as much of the original elements of the train station as, as possible within the rooms or within the event space so I, I agree i think a boutique hotel would be the best way to go let's pivot to food news olga's kitchen in the westlands shopping center of course the city of westland is the only city named after a shopping center it is closed after uh, more than 40 years olga's man like everyone around this table remembers peak olga's is yeah does Olga still have the juice? Like, I still crave Snackers. And I can get into my alternatives, but Snackers are kind of the end of the line. Let's talk about Olga's and, and what's going on with it. You know, I, I just was out there at that particular location not too long ago. And it was a great option for my wife, who's vegan and uh, gluten-free. So we can only eat at like three places on <laughs> Earth. It, it was a place that she was able to go to and really find a lot of cool stuff. So now that that location is gone, it sucks. But to your question, yeah, I, I think it's game seven on Olga's. Like, y you know, the mall experience, which is at That's what Olga's, they thrived on, right? Olga's was in every mall. I remember going to Oakland Mall and- In Fairlane yeah, yeah. and yeah. all of them. But with no mall experience, with people not going to the mall like they used to, I'm just not sure that people go to Olga's like they used to. I just went to Olga's on the 19th because it was my dad's birthday and so I needed a little bit of remembering my dad and my dad and I always would go to Olga's specifically the Macomb Mall Olga's and it was packed <laughs> but it's like there's a nostalgia vibe to mm -hmm. it that I feel like could be really capitalized on I'm, I'm glad to hear it was packed yeah it was busy and actually somebody did steal my orange cooler because I wanted to pretend that I was five again and actually ordered one and I went up and I was like, where's my orange cooler? And she's like, it was right there. And I was like, somebody stole it. <laughs> so I will say the quality has pretty much stayed the same. I know they've added certain wraps and different things. But man, that broccoli soup and the Olga salad and snackers always hit. They have iconic dishes. That's mm -hmm. a great point. I mean, you talked about the orange cooler. You talked about the broccoli soup. That bread is has still not been replicated. Oh, no. mm -hmm. The snackers that we can get into more, that dipping well, sauce, cheese, it's, whatever it is. It's like, like an almond so paste. They, they literally cheese. have paste. They literally have items that have not been replicated. So like you have to give them some credit and give them their flowers because like Olga is still a place where there is absolutely iconic dishes there. I think that they are trying. I mean, as Norris pointed out, like tying yourself to a mall now is just like a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So they have been trying to get out of malls. There's two Olga's within driving distance of me. They're both not in malls. They're in like the Allen Park shopping hill and off of Ford Road. So like they do have some locations where they're trying to get away from like the mall culture because that is dying. And I hope they can hang on. I miss the Olga's that was downtown and, and one campus Martian. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? Yep. There was the Calexico, which you also- I love you, the Calexico. You, you're the one guy. <laughs> that, you're that one you're guy. You're the only human being I know that likes Calexico. I the love R.I.P. Calexico forever. Those nachos were amazing. <laughs> Good to note, though, that that space actually has not been refilled, although there's been words that Fabio Faviani, yeah, I think it's under it construction. It's, for, it's, it's, it's for, coming along. So yeah. I actually visited Sienna Tavern that he also runs in downtown Chicago. It is amazing at a very good price point. So I'm actually kind of positive about that. I know that's a sidebar. Here's the thing. I find myself wandering to other spots than Olga's. And I'm going to give you a couple of recommendations. And this is maybe because my palate has changed. I'm not going to say it's Olga's fault. Maybe it's me who's changed. Yeah. Meat sauce. 
in uh, Eastern Market, really okay. good, like really good wraps. And then Zestia has really expanded as like a mini local chain, started in Warren. I was totally suspect about the chain starting there or whatever, but listeners were like, you got to go, you got to go. And you know what? If I'm running around, whatever, I think it's uh, definitely worth a try if you're into that same vibe, but you're not into Ogus. It's definitely a different take. Yeah, for sure. I just think, unfortunately, a lot of the energy that used to go to Olga's went to like Bucharest and so many mm, other, and okay. so many others, I would say hyper focused on one or two items type chains. And, and I just think, you know, Olga's instead of nailing down the thing that like this is our dish that you drive yeah. 20 miles to come and get, they didn't really nail that down. And uh, yeah, I think they suffer for it. Okay. So if we think that Olga's isn't necessarily as far as Mind share what it used to be. What's the one thing we'll go around the table that Olga's could do to like elevate it up? Because there's a lot of nostalgia for this brand. <sighs> Jerry, I don't. I, they have iconic dishes. I don't know. Like double down on what they do best. I guess maybe you could maybe pair get the word out about it. Paired on the menu, be more of a fast casual place. Like most people, you know, Shane mentioned, like it was packed and it does get packed sometimes. But I also see it's probably dead. So I would say maybe pare it down, make it more fast casual, and just simplify the menu. I do want to point out that there are two different types of Olga's, okay? There's the Olga's on Woodward that is that fast, casual place where you go into the counter, you order your food, and you go and sit down, and they bring it out to you. They have a pared-down menu. And then if you go to, like, a sit-down Olga's, which is the closest one to me is at 12 in Southfield, that one is a you sit down, they give you a menu, and then you order. But isn't that confusing in itself? It is very confusing. I Absolutely. haven't experienced this fast casual. Orders. I will be the first one to say that it is very confusing. So I feel like they kind of have a bit of an identity crisis. They don't exactly know which way they want to turn. And I do think that that fast casual style came out of when they were bought. The thing is, is that we're, we're going to talk about this in our final topic. Things and consumption habits are changing, Norris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the suggestion I would have actually is is very different. I, I think you can pare down the menu, but I actually would lean more into your vegan options. I think people who are vegan or vegetarian are actually looking for more of those fast casual style places and more of the places where you could just pick something up and go home or whatever. Like lean into that actually because that market is ready for the taking in Southeast Michigan and nobody's really claimed it yet. Though I hate to say it, it tends to do well in higher end markets. Absolutely. 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 So well, I'm not necessarily saying within the city of Detroit proper, but definitely out in, you know, Oakland County or Western Wayne County, you know, get people to come from Ann Arbor to buy that stuff. And I think you'll be in much better shape. All right. Finally, I want to talk about this idea that was in an editorial in Bloomberg. And it's about the introvert economy. The, the, the headline is the introverts have taken over the U.S. economy. It's by Allison Schrager. It's been getting some talk. The idea being is that with the pandemic and since the pandemic, we have changed how we consume what we consume and that it's a more permanent move. One key thing that was highlighted about New York restaurants is that the top reservation time has moved a lot earlier in the day. It's moved to 530 from 8 p.m., and that's a change since the pandemic. So the top reservation time for New York restaurants, which is kind of the gold standard, 5.30 p.m., 8 p.m., no longer. In fact, I've been hearing a lot of talk of, oh, well, we need to do more late-night stuff and whatever, but also a lot of talk of there's nowhere near enough business to support it anymore. Let's go around the table and talk about it. Norris. Can't stand it. Listen, I consider myself a pure extrovert. I cannot stand dinner at 5.30. I'm much more of a dinner at 7.30, dinner at 8. We have drinks, we have an evening, and then we go home. Dinner at 5.30 means I get home at 7 or 8, and now I'm in that weird in-between of like, do I start winding down for the night? What do I do? That's not enough You don't time. have to go home after dinner, Norris. No, but listen, but my point is, is it's too dang on early, all right? And I'm tired of the world being run by you people with crumb snatchers. Us childless <laughs> people would like to stay out at night, but since everybody can't find babysitters or send the kids over to their sisters or whatever, we got to suffer. So I'm tired of it. I will say that one of the number one feedback points I'm getting as of late is the frustration of even middle late night, like 8, 9, 10, let alone like the midnight stuff. Cheyenne, as uh, now we're going to get into the crumb snatcher portion of the program. Right. So I have two crumb snatchers. Now, while they both stay up late, 
my husband is the one who's like, ooh, I don't want to eat past 730. So we tend to eat on the earlier side. I don't mind eating a little bit later. Like if I can get a reservation at eight, okay. But I will say that my best friend and I are going to She-Wolf and we had to reschedule our our dinner because it fell on the night of that wonderful ice storm. Uh. And she went to rebook it and it was like, oh, well, next week's options are like eight o'clock and nine. And she's like, nope, what's the next week? So we both are like, yeah, like, can we get a seven o'clock? Cool. Yeah, this is totally borne out by the data. Because I, I, as someone who is constantly looking for reservations now for nights out, because nights out have to be planned, as someone who's constantly looking for reservations, the absolute block that is always unavailable is 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. That can It's so hard to find those. And then, yeah, you can find a late dinner. You can find a super early. You cannot find kind of a 5 to 7. And I'm all for it. I mean, I love the idea of eating at that time. And I was before the crumb snatcher, actually. I got to say. So even now, even now, yes, it fits my routine. My daughter goes to bed by 7.30. It makes sense to eat dinner at 5.30, 6 o'clock. Even if we're going out to eat, it makes sense. The babysitter comes over, whatever. You got your night. But even before that, it was kind of one of those routines of you go to you work after work maybe you grab a happy hour drink and then you go eat dinner and then the night is for whatever you want it to be you can continue to drink to me eight nine o'clock that's just time for cocktails that's time to make a move to a place where you're gonna have cocktails maybe listen to some music maybe you can grab a snack or so something you're not else. going to bed at eight no i'm not going to bed at eight it's just a matter of i'm eating dinner i don't like to eat dinner and then go to bed i don't know that's maybe that's just my persnicketiness but like i like to like eat dinner and then have some time to just digest have have a drink relax like That's how I am. We've shared our personal thoughts. Let's go back around, but let's talk about the analysis. What is this going to mean? Because we have seen so many closures and so many things where they got through the pandemic. Maybe they got some support for PPP or whatever, but these shifts seem to be pretty permanent and there's a lot of people who are still trying to adjust with stuff i would love to hear everybody's opinion on this but for me i feel like it's a a huge negative because if everybody is going out to dinner at that five six o'clock block that still is very much so dependent on when people get off work or quote unquote stop Mm -hmm. working for Uh, there is no world where i stop working at forever exactly and so for many of us who stops working at five Who stops working at 530? So I feel like if that block is taken up, people are then just going to decide to stay at home. As you just said, if you can't get a dinner reservation at 630, people just ain't going to go out because you've been at home all day. You want to get out in the evening. Well, if you're not leaving till 730, you're not going to leave. That's crazy to me. I think one thing that's borne out in this is the compression of where people go. So like downtown Detroit's getting a lot of staycation, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. experiences where people more and more are going to their neighborhood joints than going out for traveling because they'll be like working from home or whatever. And that kind of trend towards introversion, I think, also sometimes shortens their trips. We'll keep going. Cheyenne? I would be interested to see how things are in other cities that are completely 100 percent 24 hour, like Las Vegas, for instance. Mm -hmm. When I used to work in Las Vegas and live there. I would work graveyard shift and I would go to the bar afterwards. You know, we used to have a lot more late Mm -hmm. shifts and I feel like we have less people working third shift than we used to. I was just in Vegas last year. All the restaurants closed at nine. What? Yes. Like the hotel restaurants all were closed at the latest by 1030. Okay. That was absurd. It's Vegas. Well, I want to say there are other restaurants off the strip that are like local places. I'm wondering. I ain't going off the strip. I know. I know. But I'm saying like if you're living in Las Vegas- of course. Then you're going to go to the bar and you're going to go to BT's and it's going to be open after shift and you're going to be going in and getting a beer at six in the morning. I mean, I think it's an indictment of kind of like the downtown Detroit scene of where we're at. And we mm-hmm. talk about it. I mean, man, have, my, man, do we talk about it? But there's not enough people who are living there their enti- like the whole time. So they have to plan on like, if I'm going to eat dinner downtown on a weekday, I'm going to do it right after I get off work. I'm not going to go home and then come back downtown for dinner. The other thing I'm seeing a huge rise of, and I know this even from listeners. Hello, listeners that are living in the suburbs, and if they are of means, they're getting a pied de terre in the city in those apartments. There's, It seems to be a growing thing where it's like, hey, I'll get a, a two-bedroom and go in half season. And you know what? If you're a person of means, these rents aren't insane for you, especially compared to getting a hotel downtown, right? Because these hotel prices are now in the 300s, 400s. It is a sustained price. It's going to stay up there. So if you're going downtown all the time, it's far cheaper to go in half seas on a two bedroom. And I'm seeing more and more and more of it, not just Airbnbs, but that kind of stuff. That is definitely something I'm seeing a rise. Well, in. are those people eating dinner earlier or later? 
I don't know. That's a great I'm assuming, question. I'm assuming you're in, implying well, I'm also they're going to be there. They're going to be there on the weekends, though. But to what you're asking, though, I do think you're going to see places opening earlier, closing earlier, like Norris kind of alluded to in I Vegas. I hear engineer like, Randy weeping. I know he's I mean, Randy, so Randy is Randy is going it. to hate this, but I think places that would have stayed open till 12, 11, even 10 o'clock. No, it's like your dinner service is four to nine, and we're closed at nine. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. I can't stand it. <laughs> it's, it's, I can't stand it. And I think Norris also, hates it. I love it. Well, no, but the thing think? is, I, I think it actually also cuts off an entire segment of society of those people who work second shift, who do get off later at night, who will have no other choice than to now go and eat fast food. And we always want to talk about we want our society to be healthier. Well, if all you can eat is checkers then, yeah, you're not going to have a great time. So, you know, I think it cuts off that segment of society. I think it cuts off childless people because now we have no options for late at night because all of us work until 7 p.m. And then I think also kills the night vibes of your city. Cities need night vibes, right? Like part of why New York is cool to me is because it doesn't matter what time of day it is. I got something to do. That's, you know, I've experienced that in, in many cities around the world. And we we don't really have that and haven't had that really since bankruptcy, in my opinion. But we used to have a pretty vibrant nightlife. And I just feel like when restaurants close late at night, you kind of lose that energy. And I think that sucks. I think the late night is for the more casual spots, the, ba the bars that, that serve food. You still have that. I'm not saying that the bars are all of a sudden going to close at 9 p.m. But I think for some of the more fine dining restaurants, yeah, probably that's the case. And then, yeah, I mean, guess sucks, but you go to you go to, you go to the bars for food. How will mobsters do business? Okay, if they can't go to dinner at ten thirty, okay, this is going to be an issue that for is our point. underworld. Yeah. How, 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 late is, how late is London Chop House? <laughs> All right, everyone, listen. Thank you so much to Devin O'Reilly, Cheyenne Nosserini, Norris Howard. Everybody's in this is the dream of having a studio here at Tech Town for Daily Detroit to be able to finally bring everybody together and not talk over each other the entire time. With that, I am Jer Stays. Thank you so much for listening to your Daily Detroit. Remember to leave five stars on your favorite podcast app. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit. <laughs>